Up next is Andrew Jones. Mr. Jones leads planning of future HVC and AI capabilities for Azure as part of the Corporate Engineering and Product Group at Microsoft. He joined Microsoft in early 2020 after nearly 25 years' experience in the supercomputing community, spanning times as a researcher, end user, software developer, HPC service manager, and impartial consultant on HPC strategy, technology evaluation, and cost value models. He's been lucky to have had rare exposure to state of practice in a wide range of HPC services, facilities across industry, government, and academia around the world. Today, Mr. Jones will present Looking Back on Exascale. Mr. Jones, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, so uh, I threw out this um, title, Looking Back on Exascale, um, and it caused some fun on Twitter when I mentioned I was going to give a talk calling Looking Back on Exascale. Um, uh, there were some various interpretations of the talk title from uh, me being provocative, which is not unheard of in a presentation by me, um, to uh, me making some unexpected announcement about Microsoft's Exascale plans, um, to the talk being set in the future, being one of those stylistic talks that looks backwards in time, um, to reviewing the path that led us to the brink of Exascale and, and other interpretations. So we are going to talk a little bit about Exascale in the cloud um, and what Microsoft has or hasn't done in that space, and then we're going to spend uh, a little bit of time talking about my view of the path that's, that's brought the community to, to Exascale, to the brink of Exascale. Um, so the question is, do the big cloud companies have um, Exascale computing already? Um, well, of course, if you listen to all of your cloud marketing, the cloud is infinite. Um, and uh, so, of course, by definition, therefore, we have Exascale already. Um, uh, hopefully, um, the audience knows that the cloud is not infinite and that that is just um, some early ambitious claims of, of the cloud companies. The, the cloud is definitely not infinite. Um, I also ran a little quick poll on Twitter um, through the day today um, before I did this talk and asked the, the, the HPC community on Twitter, what do you think? Do the um, cloud providers already have Exascale computing? So you know, one option was, um, yes, if you add everything up, um, you know, in the silly sense of just the sum of all the, the compute instances installed, there's more than an Exascale worth of compute. And about half of the people went for that, or just over half of the people went for that option. The other one was says, well, even if you just restrict it to HPC type instances, there's still more than an Exascale worth of capacity, or an Exaflop, sorry, worth of capacity. But only about 15% 15, 15 of people um, believed in that one. And then about um, uh, nearly a third of people believe that uh, the cloud providers don't have Exascale and aggregate yet. So if we look at, um, at what Microsoft has said publicly about our data center infrastructure, uh, we have 61 um, Azure regions, and each region is a, a collection or a grouping of data centers. Um, they're not all the same size. Some are big, some are small. Um, but if we look at the... Um, the, the Dublin facility, for example, it's an overhead shot here of the data centers in Dublin, um, data center three, data center four, or Dublin three and Dublin four. Um, I don't know offhand what the capacities in those data centers are or the power consumption of those data centers, but just looking at the numbers of chillers on the roofs and kind of making a hand wave estimate, we'll call it 10 megawatts per building for the sake of argument, which is somebody who knows data centers better than me can make a different estimate. But. That's not an unreasonable guess, I guess, just by counting chillers. Um, but of course, that's an old photo. And a newer photo looks like this, where you have that um, Dublin 3 and Dublin 4, but then of course you've got another Dublin 5 behind it, which is actually the same size as the first two combined. Um, and even that's an older photo, and the campus looks something like this. So your Dublin 3, 4, 5 are over there in the background. We've now got a Dublin 6 here in the foreground, 7 and 8. Um, and in fact, um, that photo is probably out of date as well, and the campus is being further developed in that big empty space in the middle. Um, so, you know, without doing any more um, detailed sums, you can get pretty quickly to the idea of the scale of the data center infrastructure that you know, a cloud provider has in one location, and as I said, we have you know, 60 odd of these locations of varying scales around the world. Um, so, is it credible that we have more than an exaflops? peak capacity if you add together the peak performance of all of the cores and the cloud. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I said, without commenting particularly on the, the actual numbers, I mean, it's 
Um, you can probably easily add this lot up and get to something like a gigawatt of compute, which is a lot more than the projection of power numbers for exaflops. So you, I would, I, my guess would be that yes. Um, also, if you want a different analysis, Timothy Prickett Morgan, um, at the next platform has done various analyses of this over the years of how much compute the various cloud providers have got installed. So given, I'm obviously not going to comment explicitly on, on, on that number, partly because I don't actually know. Um, I've not bothered to go and uh, find out. Um, what is known about the scale of capacities that we have in the cloud infrastructures? Um, well, um, at Microsoft, we recently announced a top five supercomputer for OpenAI um, a few months ago now. Uh, it was a dedicated supercomputer for um, OpenAI, where OpenAI is a customer um, and a collaborator in the, in the, um, in the AI world for, with Microsoft. Um, and this is a, actually a genuine deployed supercomputer capability. It was not just counting up virtual machines that they happened to use one day or whatever. It was a dedicated capability for OpenAI. Um, it's a real HPC system. Um, we disclosed it's got 300,000 CPU cores, 10,000 GPUs, 400 gigabits InfiniBand interconnect. Um, we didn't really disclose much else. Um, there's been plenty of speculation on the internet um, about the what the CPUs are and what the GPUs are and so on. Um, I suppose I can reveal that NVIDIA are involved in the system, but I can only say that because NVIDIA have bought Mellanox and of course the InfiniBand is Mellanox. Um, so I'm cheating a little bit there. There was all sorts of other speculation about what, you know, whether it's a crate system and so on. Um, uh, the only thing I'll say is kind of keep your eyes and ears open. We might talk about this a little bit more in the, um, in the future. What did we mean by top five when we talked about this system? This is another kind of speculation. You know, were we just adding up um, single precision or half precision um, operations uh, to try and artificially get it to a higher number? Um, no, we were just being literal, the same as anybody else who um, would talk about having a top five supercomputer in the supercomputer community, which means that if we'd chosen to run Linpack on it, um, we would have hoped um, or predicted or expected, call it what you will, that it would have ranked in position five or higher on the list. Um, we are being a little bit deliberately ambiguous about exactly where in the top five or we think it would list. So we didn't actually say it is number five. We said somewhere in the top five. Um, but neither ourselves nor our customer OpenAI, OpenAI wish to dedicate time running Limpack on it. But it gives you an idea of some of the skills. And then the other thing I'll say is that that is not the only project of that scale that Microsoft Azure gets involved in. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a big project, but it's not the only one of that scale that we get involved in. Um, the other thing we talked about publicly is um, we've had various applications, tightly coupled HPC applications, scaling to 80,000 cores, and we showed some you know, um, near linear scaling numbers for that. Again, this is based on our core public cloud infrastructure rather than dedicated to one customer. Um, where we have a, um, a HPC class InfiniBand interconnect cluster as the, the, um, the infrastructure underneath that. And this is something that other clouds don't do. So this is a, a uniquely um, Azure approach to the cloud where we're deploying HPC clusters as the infrastructure underneath it rather than um, you know, just um, HPC class nodes, but interconnected with some form of accelerated Ethernet type infrastructure. About 80,000 cores um, of the HPV2, which is the ROM processors from AMD, it's only about two and a half petaflops, so it's a long way from exascale. Um, so the question then becomes, how many of these two and a half petaflop clusters do I have? Um, you know, do I have more than 400 of them to get to exaflops? Um, or do I have single clusters bigger than two and a half petaflops? Um, or indeed, do I have a whole lot of other supercomputing and HPC lying around, not just these two and a half petaflop clusters? And um, unfortunately, you probably guess what I'm going to say here. No comment, or at least otherwise not without an NDA in place. Um, so whether or not the cloud providers have more than an exaflops of compute yet, and whether they have more than an exaflops of HPC compute yet, and so on, um, is much fun. Um, but it's of questionable value. I think the, the kind of the statement out of these scale slides we've been talking about here is that the primary public clouds are unquestionably at big enough scale to share relevant lessons for exascale. So what might come into play here? Um, some of the lessons that, that we've learned directly or that I've learned over the years from observing exascale program, um, small effects add up um, 
Very much so. For example, um, the difference between a PUE number for your data center of 1.07 or 1.08, if you're running a single 10 megawatt data center, is about a million dollars a year. So it's significant, but it's not, you know, um, uh, big necessarily in, in context of the, the program overall. But um, if you have got a hundred of those data centers around the world, then suddenly you're looking at a hundred million dollar year a bill just for the difference between a PUE of 1.07 and 1.08. And so small differences become big issues at at, um, at scale. And then the other side of things is, or one of the other key aspects is, is technology bets. In order to deploy an exascale system, <clears throat> or indeed a large cloud environment, you're going to have to bet on a technology. You have to decide what it is you're going to deploy at that scale. Um, and the um, the advantage in the cloud world, of course, is that we're deploying multiple supercomputers of this scale around the world. And so therefore we can um, essentially bet on multiple technologies. We can deploy some AMD GPUs, some NVIDIA GPUs, um, some AMD processors, some Intel processors, whatever. We can deploy a mix of different things. And so we can hedge our bets a little bit, but it's not totally hedging our bets. We've got to base that on some kind of market data about what customers are likely to want and so on. Um, and then the other thing that's in common with the scale um, between the cloud providers and the, let's call it the first few exascale systems, um, is that the bets you make on the technology um, are not independent of their effect on the market. So um, if the first big exascale systems all decide to go with processor A, um, or if a cloud provider decides to go all in on processor A, then not only does that direct a whole load of funding to that particular vendor to give them some stability and viability, um, sustainability, but it also, of course, creates a perception of stability in the marketplace and the value in the marketplace for that particular product. So our, our actions, um, when you're doing things at scale, uh, not only are we guessing what the market's going to do, the act of our guessing also in itself changes the market. It's a feedback loop. Um, it also means, of course, if we get it horrendously wrong, then that can cause damage to the market as well. Because the more you try and build everything into a single large system, um, the less likely you are to make that system optimal for every single user. Um, you, know, you, you can't be optimal for everybody, and the more you try and make it, as I said, into one particular place, one common architecture for everybody, the harder it gets. So you become suboptimal. You're trying to please the, you know, the, the best possible case for everybody, um, which causes some, some challenges at scale. Again, it's something we can do a little bit in the cloud is to buy multiple different types of things, but even there, there's limits on what you can you know, sensibly actually deploy, how many different types of things. Then there's other things. Do you deploy the capability as um, one single monolithic uh, exaflop system? Do you deploy it as 20 islands of 50 petaflops each? Do you deploy it as 1,000 islands of one petaflop each? What's the pros and cons of those different architectural decisions? And how do they reflect um, not only your most common workloads, but maybe your most important workloads, which may not be the same thing. Um, and again, when, when you get to these big scales, uh, how you choose to deploy the components of that scale uh, opens up a lot of uh, optimization space, both in technical terms, but also in business terms, as to what you, um, you know, how, you, how you break it out and what you decide to run with. And then there's other things that come into play as well at scale. Uh, when you're deploying or planning for an exascale system, you know, the first one where you're stretching technology, or certainly when we're deploying things at cloud scale, there's things like planning land purchases come into place. Never mind just data center designs and cluster designs and you know, architecture node designs and so on. Things like actually planning out your land purchases and understanding um, different tax regimes for where to locate stuff and so on. So scale brings a whole lot of slightly different things into play. When you're doing things at these big scales, especially when you're doing it in a high-profile way, such as being the first or an early exascale system, um, or being a, you know, a large cloud provider that the media likes to throw rocks at, um, getting it right is important. Never mind for business reasons, getting it right as well. Um, and so people put a lot of effort into getting it right, researching the technologies, helping to steer the technologies, doing benchmarking work, working with users, working with applications, and so on. Um, but of course, that has a cost. Uh, and then it, there becomes a balanced decision between what is the cost of um, essentially doing the work to, to be sure of getting it right or to have a degree of confidence you're getting it right versus 
what is the cost impact of getting it wrong? Um, and of course, scale, as I said before, profile certainly matters, but scale makes a difference here as well. There are more things that can go wrong at scale, um, and the cost of getting it wrong probably is higher as well. Um, obviously, in hindsight, it's a wonderful tool, but we do know in the HPC community that, that HPC systems do go wrong from time to time. Um, in fact, we're seeing it with the Exascale program in the US to some extent. So how is Azure addressing these problems at scale? Um, we're starting by recruiting supercomputing people or genuine HPC talent. Um, that's a deliberate strategy we've decided to undertake. Um, you'll recognize some of the names that have joined Azure from, from the HPC community. There's others you may not recognize necessarily by name, but there is this intent to build deliberate supercomputing or HPC community expertise from um, you know, from the whole, across the whole chain, from the sales teams to the technical support teams to the technical people designing and the engineers in my team designing the future capabilities in the cloud through to the people doing the business planning and so on. So it's trying to get HPC knowledge and expertise through that whole um, experience. And then off the back of that, designing a HPC capability that is a HPC capability, not just something labeled as such. It's aimed at HPC workloads, HPC applications, um, and also HPC customers in the way they like to interact with the world. Um, and as I said, this you know, is based on this idea of infinity band interconnect clusters at the moment. Um, and then obviously there's some, you know, as always, there are some more confidential elements to this that make it a genuine HPC cluster in, uh, infrastructure or that we may be evolving towards over the future that I'm not going to talk about in this environment, but we could talk about and appropriate private environments for those that are relevant. Um, and so really we are, um, in some respects, certainly when I look at my group in terms of the, the engineering and the product group planning this stuff, we're, we're not just behaving like a supercomputer center in the cloud um, rather than a cloud provider in the world, the way we do the thinking and planning. So moving on to um, the other topic I wanted to cover then, which was uh, looking back at what's brought us to the brink of exascale. Um, I went through back and, and looked at various presentations and reports and documents um, that going back from kind of 2010 to 2016-ish made all sorts of predictions about what was going to happen with Xscale and what we we're going to have to do to get there and so on. Um, and these aren't all from the same source and some of them are contradictory maybe, but just to flavor the kind of things that we said over the years, um, as this, you know, I was in this community myself hoping to get involved in a lot of these things at the time. Um, Exascale systems are going to have 100 million to a billion cores. Um, one to 10 billion, or in one case, even so 100 billion way concurrency. They're going to be operating in a mode of almost continual failure, and the resiliency and fault tolerance is going to be a massive challenge on these systems, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to have complex memory hierarchies. Major rewrites of codes, of application codes, are going to be needed to, to be able to run on these systems at all. We were going to need um, new parallel programming paradigms would be essential. The system power would be 100 megawatts. Um, and then, of course, there are a whole range of other predictions that went further and just said it can't be done. We're never going to reach exascale. Um, or it, the only way we're going to reach exascale is a huge incremental investment in people, et cetera. So what actually happened? Well, looking at the smooth side of it, um, I think the reality is that we've had a fairly evolutionary path um, from petaflops to exaflops. Um, you know, if you look at the architecture at some level of the, the first exaflop system and the first petaflop system. It's a CPU plus an accelerator. Um, there's a bit of a difference in that the, there's more accelerators per CPU in the exaflop system than the petaflop system, but you know, broadly speaking, CPU plus accelerator is the, is the, is the model there. Um, I would not, you know, we haven't seen massive application rewrites due to exascale over the years. We've seen some of those significant application modernizations due to GPUs, for example, but not um, due to exascale as such. And there's no pervasive new programming paradigm throughout the HPC world or those trying to run on exascale systems, um, unless maybe you count CUDA, but you know, that's just probably playing semantics. Um, and of course, the other thing is that the same execution model is dominating MPI plus X. Um, where X is either CUDA or OpenMP or whatever it is, it's still going to be the dominant execution model on those exascale systems. So there's a lot to stay the same. There's some stuff that's been a bit more of a challenge, or there will be a bit more of a challenge. Um, the architecture and application challenges um, 
I would say they really are some in, in the exascale era. I would argue uh, actually more about the choice of exaflops era technologies that we have rather than necessarily the, the stretch and scale from petaflops to exaflops. Um, so it's a fact that we, ha we have, if you're going to deploy an exaflop system today, the choice between multiple different CPU providers, um, both x86 and non-x86 uh, ARM, uh, for example, um, and also uh, a range of different accelerator options that are, you know, even if you nominally label three of them as GPUs, they're quite distinctly different GPUs, certainly in programming terms, if not hardware architecture terms. Um, and so there's, a, there's that challenge of diversity in the, um, the technology ecosystem, which is probably more of an issue for applications are trying to figure out which, which one of those to work with, and then maybe intermediary layers like Raja and Kokos and all these kind of things coming out of the DOE labs. Um, are more about protecting the diversity of, e of technologies we have rather than necessarily the step from petascale to exascale. There's also the cost of being first. Um, it's, it's painful. We used to think of the top HPC systems being $100 million or so, um, whereas the costs for the first three exascale systems are reputedly um, five or $600 billion each. That's a huge step up in cost. Um, and I didn't see when I went back and reviewed all this old material, and it's quite surprising when you think how predominant AI is in our thinking and conversation HPC space today. It really did not crop up in most of the early predictions about Exascale. Big data did. There's a lot of talk about big data and data analytics and so on. But the concept of machine learning and AI really becoming the dominant theme around that data did not come into play until a few years ago um, in, the, in the supercomputing conversation, Exascale conversation. So that's really quite interesting. Um, and of course, it's a you know, whether you, to the extent to which it's a tick box exercise for funding agencies versus uh, um, driving the chip architects to focus their technologies on AI workloads um, versus you know attracting new users and changing the types of applications run by existing user bases. Um, it's a real impact on our ecosystem. And then the other big change that's the challenge for the, um, the HPC world and certainly the Exascale uh, era is the vendor ecosystem is, is distinctly different. There's been a lot of consolidation. So obviously HPE, for example, has absorbed both Cray and SGI from the Petascale days. Um, IBM is no longer anything like the dominant beast that it was in HPC at the, at the Petascale era. So there's been big challenges in that vendor ecosystem. And even on the processor front, if you look at the number of different ARM processor vendors that have come and gone and changed hands over time and so on, there's some consolidation, there's changes in competition, there's uncertainty in the system. Um, to some extent, there always has been, but that's, that's definitely a big challenge of the exascale era. And then, so just to kind of close down my thoughts on the exascale side of things and just reviewing where we are and how we got to where we are at the exascale position. Um, whether you call it exascale, whether you call it hyperscale, scale is different. Um, it brings new challenges where small things add up and so on, and being first and the cost of risk and so on is very different. But it also brings opportunities. Um, it does create potential to do things differently. Certainly when you're looking at a cloud environment, you're deploying multiple of these things. You can hedge your bets a little bit. But even in terms of exascale, single monolithic systems like you know, the big DOE systems, um, you are actually steering the market as well as betting on the market. So that has some advantages to it. Well, that costs money, of course. Um, I would argue that the exascale um, journey has actually ended up with being less disruptive in hardware terms than a lot of the uh, early predictions. Um, much, less, much, much, much less disruptive. But actually probably a bit more disruptive in the changes and challenges in usage models. AI, for example, um, you know, cloud type interfaces and containers and stuff. None of this was really in the early um, thinking in, in the Exascale program, if we go back to the early days from moving on from Petascale to Exascale. So there's, the changes and challenges have been more in those usage models and in the applications than in the hardware, which is, of course, a lot of the conversation at the time. Um, and then, of course, you know, I have to finish with the, the marketing line, um, HPC. Azure HPC is, is delivering real HPC in the cloud, not just um, vanilla cloud. And with that, I will close and take any questions.